Monday is here and it's before daylight today when I'm making this video and I'm going to go a little bit deeper into AC system basics you know some of this stuff is going to be reviewed some of it may surprise you some of it may not but we're going to talk about this a little bit anyway okay this is we're looking at a review here uh, you got 134 and 1234YF boils at minus 22 this boils at minus 1534 see the low boiling point of the refrigerant is what makes it a refrigerant uh, you can take some canned air and turn it upside down squirt it in a styrofoam coffee cup and you'll have liquid in there that you can slice around and look at don't leave it sitting around for somebody to drink it though like thinking it's water and you can pour that on the floor or on a table or something like that don't get it on your skin or in your eyes and it will boil like you poured water on a hot skillet um, <clears throat> don't vent refrigerant to the air always wear safety glasses it's really really important and when liquid boils, it absorbs heat. Now, this is not, I'm not going to go into the latent heat of vaporization and all that kind of thing. That's another thing. But since refrigerant boils at below zero, it causes the evaporator to get really cold. Now, the fixed orifice system it has this high pressure liquid coming out of the condenser going through that orifice, and it basically turns into, it's a low pressure liquid there, but it evaporates as it goes through the evaporator and absorbs heat. So this gets really cold, air blowing through it blows into the car cold. Here's the important thing. This process should be continuing past the evaporator through this line all the way to the compressor. If you don't have a cold suction line all the way to the compressor, then chances are you don't have, you know, provided the compressor is not faulty or whatever. If your pressures are, uh, you know, you can look at pressures and tell this too, but you got, if you're, let's say you're charging a a tractor out there somewhere you don't know what the refrigerant charge is you can keep adding refrigerant until this suction line is cold all the way to the compressor and when it's cold all the way to the compressor you know you got enough refrigerant in there just by the fact that it's cold all the way to the compressor now you don't want to get too cold but at the same time it does need to be frosty and cold right here you know if it's if it's icing up then sometimes that means there's a problem of course then you got high pressure gas coming out of the compressor there's never supposed to be any liquid here uh, to the compressor because you can't compress liquid and it'll damage it so this goes in here as high pressure gas and turns into high pressure liquid and then it repeats unless you're using a subcooler and there's what your accumulator looks like and that's what the orifice tube looks like the orifice tube really needs to be pulled out of there and looked at every time you can usually find it if you know where it is sometimes it's built into the liquid line and you can't replace the orifice without replacing the liquid line and on a like on Jeep Cherokees for example if I remember right you got to replace the liquid line uh, it, it's right to replace the liquid line whenever you replace the compressor or do any other work on there so anyway <coughs> oh by the way I meant to say too fixed orifice systems will have an accumulator alright now the TXV system it's either got, it'll be like this or like that, there are variations of it, but this one here is kind of interesting because this was the way they did expansion valves a long time ago and they still do it <clears throat> on the rear air units and then also some of the uh, Asian vehicles have got these. This is the more common kind, but that kind right there will have this tube. You notice this part right here is here. Now the sensing tube is connected to this is actually touching the line coming out of the evaporator. And so it varies the size of that orifice. That's why it's not a fixed orifice. It varies the size of that orifice so that it can control this to prevent evaporator icing. If this gets too cold, it changes the size of the orifice that this is, that's, you know, where the refrigerant is going through here. Okay, <clears throat> now this tube is built into this and senses on this kind, it senses the suction line over right here and it you know it's all in one unit this right here is sort of a sloppy design on some of the Volkswagens I used to work on there was a screen in this doggone thing that would get clogged up and it would keep the refrigerator I mean the refrigerator the air conditioner from working right and I'd go in there and clean that stupid screen up in there if I guess the right thing to do would have been to replace the expansion valve but you know everybody's pinching pennies <clears throat> receiver dryer is on the high side notice the difference in where it is this is on the low side in the suction line. That's on the high side, right there. Or it'll be on the end of the condenser. And I'll talk about that again. Thermal expansion valves will have a receiver dryer. Or they may have a subcooler. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. 
Now, uh, it's a variable orifice system. I talked about that. The sensing tube reacts to the suction temp line temperature and changes the size of the liquid orifice to prevent evaporator freezing. So you got the receiver dryer. It's got desiccant in that. Also, the accumulator's got desiccant in it. And if that desiccant bag busts, and the ones that have a bag, some of them have got it trapped in, you know, between little meshed uh, plates, <clears throat> and that's really a good system. But if they don't trap it in the, between the mesh plates and there's a bag, that bag can bust open and all the little round desiccant balls can, you know, clog up parts of the system. I've seen that before too. I, I, I had a picture of some of that going on, but I didn't put it here. Um, on a fixed orifice system, the thermal expansion valve is absent and the orifice is fixed. And there's your, you know, little accumulator drawing right there. You've got that desiccant bag I talked about a minute ago. And once again, you got liquid here. Well, I mean, high pressure liquid here, low pressure liquid here evaporating, going through there. And then it, the compressor squeezes it into a high pressure gas and it turns back into a liquid here and so on and so forth. Now the accumulator and dryer is what they look like. This right here provides a little bit of oil. There's a little hole behind that screen right there. The reason that screen's there is if this desiccant bag breaks, and I'm not really showing you a good picture of that in here, you know, it keeps that hole from getting stopped up by a desiccant ball or whatever. And so then you've got this, uh, notice how you cannot, there's liquid in here. And this is designed so that you don't get any liquid. See, that this is being draw, drawn from here down here, picks up some oil, goes out of the compressor. This is kind of like oil in a, uh, you know, putting chainsaw oil in there. In other words, chainsaw oil in the gas and the oil in the gas basically oil of the chainsaw. This is oil in the uh, compressor the same way. That's one of the reasons that the oil has got to be compatible with the refrigerant. If you just convert one from R12 to R134 without changing, you know, going with ester oil, you know, and adding some ester oil to it a pretty good bit, it's not going to and of course the oil is missable, but you're not going to be able to get any lubrication. I had one student uh, that jumped ahead of me and actually replaced the, uh, put the fittings on there, put R134 on there without adding any oil in it, and it burnt the compressor up within about a day or something. Now this one here, you might notice the desiccant is trapped in there, and there's little filter pads here. Uh, I had the one of those that I cut apart basically had a hole with, I mean a plate with a bunch of little holes in it. All right, with vans with front and rear evaporators usually have a thermal expansion valve and a fixed orifice. So the, back, the back part where the evaporator is back here will have a fixed orifice. I, I could have come up with a better picture than that, but you get the point. All right, so refrigerant flows through these. You got a discharge line. You have to remember the flow. Discharge line carries it into the condenser. Uh, the suction line, well, the suction line doesn't carry it out of there. <laughs> and so the suction line is basically coming from the evaporator to here, you know, there's your expansion valve. And so you're, there's basically, uh, there's a line missing here. I don't know if you notice that or not. It, you know, I pulled up this illustration from somebody that sells AC parts online and uh, basically doctored it for my own thing. But you have a liquid line that's not pictured here, if you notice. You've got a discharge line and you've got a suction line, but there's no liquid line pictured here. But there's your condenser slash subcooler because the dryer is made on the side of it. Okay, and then there's your evaporator and all that. I wish I had, you know, had a liquid line to show you there, but the liquid line leaves the condenser and goes to the through the through the expansion valve into the evaporator. That's what happens. Uh, and on this kind right here, you're going to have a dryer too, which, like I said, that dryer is This is a subcooler. When you see it like that, this subcooler has got that hot gas going in, right? And then there's a, there's a separator here and a separator here. And I've talked a little bit about that last week. And you, you know, you've already seen this as a review, but this is what it looks like in the real world uh, whenever you're changing one of those out. A little plastic plug there, you got to get to the right size Allen or whatever to get that out of there. Now, this is on a 2007 Ford Edge, if I remember right. And then pull that sock out of there. On the expeditions and stuff, uh, this is changed from the bottom. So you basically can go under there with everything still put together with, and uh, make sure you've evacuated the system. And there's a snap ring and a plate and all that's a little bit harder on those. I mean, I, we've done those too. But anyhow, you pull that sock out of there, put the new one in there, O-rings, they give you a new cap and O-rings and all, you screw that back down there and you just change it. But this right here is basically a subcooler. And it's got that on the side of the, of the condenser. Now this is a radiator here, but the condenser, see, is, back, is this part back here. See that? All right.
I don't, you know, <clears throat> anyway, let's go up on our electrical stuff. We got fans, we got clutches, we got switches, and uh, these right here are pretty cool. If you take a, the coil for that and put some power and ground to it, that thing will grab a hold of a metal table where you can't even pick it up. It's super strong, and uh, you got to make sure you're putting all that together. These are little um, air gap uh, adjustment shims, which I really like that better. I like air gap adjustment shims, but General Motors had these stupid kind of compressors. You would have a special tool to pull the clutch and off and on, and you would adjust it basically using this tool, this little jack tool. Uh, we had one of those too. I think I paid like $88 for that tool from GM because we had some GM vehicles over, and I had to show the students how to uh, adjust the air gap and install and uh, remove the clutch with that thing. All these switches, all different kinds of switches you got. The switches that are activated by refrigerant pressure, the switches that you push, blower and resistor, you got that. And that's going to basically, it'll either be an electronic controller thing or that. And so this is basically going to step the voltage down, going to your blower so it blows the speed you want it to, and it's not blowing wide open all the time. Fans, you got a condenser, you know, you got those, those fans, uh, sometimes they'll have them wired so that they'll run uh, in series on low speed and parallel on high speed uh, using the, the relays. I've gone over that and I had my students wire up a board that way. And this right here is your control heads and stuff like that, you know, and this right here would be going beyond this. Usually you don't have this and that, although you can, you know, but a lot of the times when you just turn it to max air, for example, on my, uh, you know, my Explorer, you turn it to max air, it doesn't matter that whether you've pushed your AC switch or not, you don't get it. Defrost, you're always going to get uh, compressor operation too. All right, the, this is a very simple schematic right here. You've got the on switch. And there's a high pressure switch and a low pressure switch and an AC clutch. That's a very simple schematic. It leaves a lot of stuff out, but you get the point. And a lot of the times these are wired in series. So that either one of them opens up, it's going to drop the AC clutch. Um, now, typically, on more vehicles than not nowadays, these switches report to the controller. I'm going to talk about that for a minute. But uh, on some of your older ones, they were basically wired so the clutch went straight through those. Now, mod more modern stuff is you got AC request, you got a high pressure cutout which is basically going to be an input and a low pressure cutout which is another input and the uh, AC relay is controlled, the coil is controlled by the PCM or amplifier. There's an amplifier on some of the uh, foreign cars, Asian units and stuff like that that have a, uh, a lot to do with I mean in other words they actually it monitors everything and turns the compressor clutch off and on and the prevents evaporator icing and shuts it off in case of high pressure and all that kind of stuff and those will be a little black box in there with a heck of a lot of wires going to them, you know. <laughs> we used to get really frustrated whenever we would open a shop manual and we would see those black boxes that said solid state and it wouldn't tell you what was going on inside of them, you know. Uh, a lot of the times the best way to do that, uh, to figure those out, is to get you a little notebook that you carry in your pocket and go to one that's working right and very diligently measure all of the, uh, you know, with a meter, measure all of the voltages and everything and all the pins during various different stages of operation and write that stuff down and then if you go back to one that you're working on like that one that's working right of course there's a lot of different ones uh, but that was how I fixed a lot of forge stuff is I started testing checking voltages and comparing good vehicles to bad ones I checked so many good vehicle voltages I knew what they were supposed to be and if I went into the hood of a bad vehicle whether I was working on ABS or whether I was working on engine control or anything like that I could basically draw on what I knew the good voltages were supposed to be and I could figure out the bad one. So, you know, the Secret Service men study real money so they can find fake money. They don't study fake money, they study real money. So we need to look as many with our scan tool or our scope or whatever. We need to gather as much information as we can from good vehicles so we'll know what a bad vehicle looks like when we see that. PCM AC input. 2000 F-150. This is an old vehicle. They were already doing it then. Pin 41 on the PCM monitors the AC clutch to adjust the IAC and all that kind of thing. But look at this. <clears throat> you know, it comes power through this switch. The AC pressure cutoff switch is open above 445. That's a high pressure one. And closed before 260. Below 260. This has got a contact there calibrated for that. And the clutch cycling switch opens at 25 PSI and closes 44 PSI. So you got a little differential there on both of those. That's how those switches work. They don't have it 
where it just off and on, like like it's going to wait, you know, there's going to be a, a range in there, like from 445 to 260 and from 25 to 44. Pay close attention to that diode when you de-energize that clutch. See, especially if this is tied in, and a lot of times it goes back to the powertrain control module uh, as a sort of a monitoring circuit. <clears throat> Obviously, whenever you collapse that field by opening up that circuit, there's going to be a, a huge spike. It can be you know, several hundred volts coming out of that clutch coil, and I've seen that destroy the radio in a cable vision truck. They were using an AC style compressor clutch to drive the power takeoff for the hydraulics, and it kept eating the radio. And it was a brand new truck. And I, so I went in there and I went to the radio with my scope, and I was checking this, that, and the other, and I turned things off and on on the dash. And finally, when I turned off that power takeoff, I saw a huge spike go screaming into the radio. And so that's what's killing the radio. And all I did, they, they didn't, they actually hooked that thing up, but they didn't put, there was no diode. So I put a little diode, it's going to be facing the right way or you'll create a dead short. But you might notice that power only goes in that direction. So when you turn off this clutch, uh, that uh, voltage that's trying to go screaming out of there chases its tail. For the same reason, they have little resistors and diodes in some uh, AC, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, some relays. The relay coil creates a spike and they want to dampen that spike so that it doesn't hurt the computer that's energizing the relay. And so you see that little uh, thing right there? You don't see that in here. Now that wide open throttle relay is an interesting thing too uh, because they don't even have this wired right. The wide open throttle relay basically is normally closed. This right here would be hooked to this. This is drawn wrong uh, from my experience. It would be hooked to, this would be hooked here to pin 4 so that when you open go wide open throttle, a power drain control module energize this and it drops that uh, air conditioner out. I had a Volkswagen diesel rabbit. I mean, if it's ever drove one of the little diesel rabbits, knows that when you turn on the air conditioner, it feels like you hooked the trailer to the back of it and slow it down. <laughs> and when you need to get on it, and on that diesel to get into traffic, that air conditioner was just taking too much away. And so they had these little switches on the injector pump, and the little switches were basically there to, it was little, uh, little switches so that it was wired to the system that turned on a little light so you know when to shift for optimum fuel economy, right? Well, I took that switch since it was my vehicle, and I cut a relay, and I built a wide open throttle AC relay, and I hooked it in there so the normally closed contacts on that relay were carrying the compressor, and then I made it where that little switch would energize the relay when I would go into wide open throttle because that switch was on the injector pump. And when I went to wide open throttle, it would automatically drop the compressor out of the circuit. And that gave me a tremendous amount of ability in traffic. It also made me not want to go so deep into the throttle because I didn't want to lose my AC if I wasn't in a situation where I need to go wide open throttle. But anyway, that diode is really important right there. And sometimes that diode will short out and burn up. And that, so if, it, if the diode opens up, and they can do that too, it doesn't happen a lot, but it used to happen sometimes. You can wind up seeing stuff that's fried because of that. Fan control is old hat. Uh, basically, you're going to have a thermal limiter right here on some of the, the Fords that had this little thermal fuse in them. Uh, that would the thermal fuse would open up on that, and they wouldn't have a blower uh, switch and a blower controller in stock. You know the resi dropping resistor here, and I would go to Radio Shack and for a dollar and fifty cents, I would buy a little thermal fuse, and I'd use little, uh, you know, little alligator clips to keep it from getting too hot while I was soldering it and I would replace the thermal fuse and I fixed a lot of those by replacing that thermal fuse. Now the reason the thermal fuse is in there is if there's current flowing through those resistors and they're really hot but the fan is not moving any air they basically won't see the, if you might notice that these thermal I mean these uh, blower resistors are always mounted in the airstream whenever it's blowing through there and that keeps them cooled off. One time I was driving to, to Savannah on a trip that I was making over there and I saw this explorer sitting beside the road and there was about half a dozen guys out there trying to figure out what was going on and uh, so I pulled in there and this lady had been driving and she said a bunch of smoke came out of the dash you know out of the registers and you know so I said good grief and so these men that were trying to help her were all standing around there looking under the hood to see what they could see and so I opened the door you know she told me what had happened I opened the door and you could smell burning leaves in there and I said, okay, here's what's going on. You actually have had uh, 
leaves that you park under trees a lot. She says, yeah. And I said, leaves have got out in there and they basically have laid on your uh, blower resistor. They've not only did they lay on the blower resistor, but they blocked the air from cooling the blower resistor that was going across the fan and it had set fire to those leaves. That blower resistor got hot enough to set fire to those leaves and the burning leaves, the smoke came out of the dash and you could smell burning leaves inside the vehicle. I said, turn off your air conditioner. Don't use your air conditioner on any speed. And I says, and go somewhere and have somebody pull the uh, blower resistor out of there and clean the leaves out of that evaporator housing as much as they can. You know, sometimes you can do that by pulling the blower out and going in there with a vacuum cleaner or whatever, you know. But anyway, I remember that little thing. But these little rascals here, basically, it's a stepped voltage thing. And interestingly enough, you notice this one here, uh, the blower is fed with power all the time by the blower relay. And this ground is what it is that is fed in steps to give the blower motor its uh, different speeds. If you got fan vibrations, you could pull the blower out and see what's in there. That's one we found. It was shaking a dash. My uh, buddy had said that his wife's Camry and was uh, shaking like it. We turned on the blower and we pulled the blower out. And it had a whole bunch of cloth and grub. Looked like somebody had run a uh, dish towel or something through the uh, washer and with a lot of bleach, and it had get basically got all stringy and came apart. And I said, does your wife ever throw rags on the dash of the car that might have gone down through? He said, no, she never does anything like that. And to this day, it's been a mystery to me and him both how those, and those were clean looking rag fibers too. I mean, they weren't like dirty, dusty, ugly stuff it was, or, or anything like that. Anyway, uh, when you turn on the AC and where you want the air to go is determined by this. You know, you have a selector switch. A lot of times they have vacuum lines coming off. And there'll be a check valve here. If that check valve goes bad, when you're into the throttle, it'll go to defrost if it's vacuum operated and all that. And so you can see how all these doors work. This one right here is your heater core. That's your evaporator. Uh, this is your inside versus outside air. When you turn it on max AC, uh, you're basically using um, inside air only. You're re-air conditioning the inside air. That's why on a long trip, if you run your AC on max, you'll basically give yourself a... Uh, a colder air with better fuel economy too because you're not pulling in hot air from outside and air when the air condition that as it comes in. However, sometimes there's some crud that grows on the evaporator because it's sweaty and wet all the time because it's cold like a glass of tea. And so a lot of times they say you need to run your air conditioner on norm at least part of the time so that uh, you don't, you're less likely to grow this smelly uh, fungus uh, stuff or you know mildew or whatever on your uh, the evaporator. There's a bunch of treatments that they had for that chemicals you'd missed in there and you'd have to wear a breathing mask that was really solid. Not a mask like for COVID, but I'm talking about one that wouldn't let anything in because that was really, really poisonous stuff they would put in there. I have actually, when I had a smelly one, I've actually taken Lysol and out here I'd put it on Norm and I'd get out here in front of the windshield where the air comes in from Norm and I would just fog Lysol in there like you wouldn't believe. And just keep on fogging a whole can of Lysol in there. And that Lysol gets in there and kind of kills the mildew. And also makes the inside of the car smell really nice. But anyway, that's... Uh, and you you got your defrost. Like I say, it, for safety reasons, it defaults to defrost when you lose your vacuum. Like if a rat chews a hole in that or, you know, whatever. All right, so blending warm and cool air is typically done on most modern vehicles like since the 90s with an electric blend door actuator that can stop anywhere it wants to. And that's how this typically works. And uh, there are very few vehicles use vacuum for blend, I mean for warm and cold anymore. It just doesn't usually happen. Now a lot of them will have a heater control valve out there that turns off the coolant going through the heater core. But they'll still have a lot of these heater control valves that are out there in the, in the lines going to the heater core. They'll actually have a bypass part and whenever you turn off the heater, that vacuum diverts the coolant that would go through the heater core so that it is still bypassing through that heater control valve, uh, but it's not going through the heater core. And that keeps your heater core from taking heat in there that you don't want. Uh, but what you can do if you've got one that all the pressures are right, the suction line is cold all the way to the compressor and everything, and you want to see if you've got an issue with your heater, you need to get into the, you need to pinch one of the heater hoses, but you need to know which one to pinch. If you pinch the heater hose coming out of the heater core, there may be enough pressure build up in that heater core to bust the heater core. See, because not all vehicles have a heater control valve that diverts the water past the heater core. So if you pinch that, 
uh, the, the one coming out instead of the one going in. The small one is the one going into the heater core or the one it will have an orifice inside of that one that's slowing the water down. But the big one is the one coming out or the one that's most freely flowing. And uh, if you hook those hoses up backwards, you're liable to bust the heater core. And you know, and it's, a lot of the times that happens. You know, if particularly if one of those uh, heater pipes has got an orifice in it and the other one doesn't, we had a little, uh, we had some noisy heater core stuff going on with some of the Tauruses years ago back at the Ford dealer, and they would have them put an orifice in one of those heater tubes, but they weren't putting it in the right tube, and they would put the uh, <laughs> it kept busting the heater cork because they were hooking the hoses and both of those were the same size and they would hook, hook the hoses up backwards to the heater core and the pressure in the heater core would bust the heater core and it happened repeatedly on one guy's car and he came in there throwing a fit about it. I can understand why. But anyway, you know, you still got this same hookup like I was talking about earlier. Now this is a kind of a funny story. You see that screen right there? That's like an 85 Buick Riviera. And what they'd had on that, that was a visionary car. That was an old CRT screen, is what it was. And what you would do is, this controls your radio and every darn thing. You just had to select what you wanted. It was a touch screen inside the car. You can look that up. It's like an 85 Buick Riviera, if I remember the year model right. So one of those came into the school over to be worked on. And there's this guy that was like 44 years old. He was laid off from a cotton mill and he wanted to you know, learn an automotive. He still works, by the way, at a shop. And that, my goodness, that's, he's been working over for 20 years now. But anyway, the point is, <laughs> it was funny to me because I told us, Jerry, get in there and turn on the air conditioner on this uh, Riviera and let's see if the, the clutch comes on. So he goes in there and he sits in there and he sits in there and he sits in there rubbing his face and he said, I don't know. He, I don't know how to turn on the air conditioner on this car because all he had in the middle of the screen was this. And he had never seen that, couldn't figure out what to do with it and all that. And so he says, uh, I said, come on, Jerry, you ought to be able to figure that out. And so I sat down in there and I was rubbing my face. <laughs> I was trying to figure it out just like he was. But finally, I started looking at that screen. You had to select that you wanted to, you know, AC controls and then, and all that because everything was done right there. You know, that was a visionary thing. But anyway, uh, there was another vehicle, like on some of the older Mazdas, that you had to pull out. Or they had these little slide levers across here, you know, like some of them used cables to do. You had to pull out on, on that to in, engage the compressor. And it was, you know, they, they had little words down there, but if you didn't happen to notice that, there wasn't a button to turn on the compressor. You had to click and pull that out. It was a strange thing. You've got to make sure you know how to turn on the compressor because you may misfire on your diagnosis if you don't know how to turn on the air conditioner and the customer's been driving it. Anyway, we're working on the AC because it doesn't cool well or doesn't cool at all. So we turn it on and see if the compressor will kick in. We'll see if it starts spinning. It may take a few seconds. Look for anything like this thing dragging against the hub whenever it's not turned on. That's not good. The air gap's too close. Um, and if you have it, if you have one where um, it's not, it's too far out, it may initially grab, but it may warm up and it may stop kicking in whenever it tries to cycle back in because the air gap's too much. In those cases, you, if you got it, if it's energized, there's power going to it, but it hasn't pulled in, you can gently reach over and tap it with a screwdriver handle or something. Depending on where the compressor is, you don't want to do it the wrong way and hurt yourself. But you, if you can just tap on that with something, it kicks in and runs until the next time it cycles off. You know your air gap set too wide. All right, it may take a few seconds for the PCM to turn it on. It doesn't turn it on all all the time. Well, if this doesn't run, what you gonna do next? All right? Let's see what we're gonna do next. All right, we got to let me back up. We gotta find the fittings. The low side port usually the suction line. Or the accumulator and the high side port tends to be on the discharge line between the compressor and the condenser. But, you know, they move these around a little bit. You just, but you'll recognize them. Uh, on that one Jaguar we worked on, I mentioned earlier, the, if I remember right, the low side charge port was underneath the car close to the driver's side tire facing down which or, or out or something. It was the stupidest fool thing I've ever seen where they would put that down there. Nowadays, most of your manufacturers will put these really close together, really easy to find, and it's really handy that they do that. Low side, high side, you can't hook them up backwards because it's you know, different. The high side is the bigger port. All right, you're supposed to have an identifier. There are lots and lots and lots and lots of shops out there that do not have refrigerant identifiers because they don't want to spend the money on it, they don't see the point in it, and they feel like they've done it just fine. But you know, a lot of these, I've actually had used our refrigerant identifier, and I've seen uh, hydrocarbons. I've seen uh, lots of, like, I've actually seen 130, I mean, R12 
systems, when I tested it, there were 100% 134. Somebody had managed to get all of the R12 out of there and charge that same system with the same fittings. It had R12 fittings, and I would never have known that if I didn't have a refrigerant in the fire. Now, I know you probably don't want to. You know, Peter Call is the guy that... Uh, the you know, guy that I know that works with Neutronics, and they sell these refrigerant identifiers, but there are other people that make them. And this one here is one that came from Neutronics, and, and they make, I think, the best ones, in my opinion. And see, this one here was 76% R12, but only 23% R134. I have seen them where they'd be like 5% hydrocarbons, because a lot of these bogus refrigerant people used to put uh, stuff like butane and propane in the cans, you know, which is a disaster if you have a car crash and a refrigerant leak inside the car with a spark, you know. So if it's contaminated with mixed gas, you're supposed to remove the trash gas using a bottle that's gray, according to the, the uh, it, you know, the regulations, government regulations, you're supposed to use it. It's gray with a yellow top, and you use a dedicated machine to pull that juice out. Don't use your big machine. Use a dedicated machine to pull that out uh, and put it out. This one here had contaminated gas in it, uh, that vehicle there, the charger or whatever it was. All right, so you connect the identifier so you'll know what it is before you do anything else. If the identifier shows the gas is pure and the right kind, a little bit of air in there doesn't matter all that much as far as your identifier. But identifier may not even determine, uh, catch air anyway if the air is somewhere other than where you're taking your sample. That one there is one that I, we had one like that at the school. Uh, it show, if the gas pressure is around 100 pounds, and it ought to kick the compressor on, even if it's not cooling right, because you can't, there are no specifications for what the static pressure is supposed to be. There just aren't. You go, you may find one that's got good looking static pressure, but you know, crappy running pressures and all that. I don't know how many times I've seen that, but this right here in and of itself is not enough to tell you much of anything other than the fact that you've got enough refrigerant in there that it should close the necessary switches to operate the compressor clutch. The pressure, if the pressure is low, it's a good bet the system low on juice. In other words, if you're seeing these numbers way back over here on both sides, like you notice, this is a 500 pound gauge and that's a, uh, basically stops at 120, you got that little extreme. But that's why this is gonna be, see both of those are reading about the same reading, if you look at it. All right, low pressure cutout switch is usually less than 24 pounds and all that. So if, if these aren't up this high, now here's something else you need to think about. Ambient temperature will make a difference on these pressures. It'll make a difference on the AC cycles, and it'll make a difference on how it cools. Uh, a vehicle that has an air conditioner that cools really good at night may have one that whenever in the heat of the day it won't cool worth a flip. And so you got it, the ambient temperatures have a tremendous impact on how the AC works and what the pressures are because the pressure and temperature is connected to one another. All right. Okay, if there's no pressure, if there's no pressure, do a vacuum and check and see if it'll hold a vacuum for a few minutes. A full vacuum is 30 inches of mercury on the low side of the gauge. However, there can be a leak that will only leak under pressure, and there's no way you can tell that with a vacuum. You're only going to find a big leak with a vacuum. If you've got a leak that only leaks if there's 50 or 60 pounds of pressure on it, then you're never going to find that with a vacuum test. You're going to have to put dry nitrogen in there or something to spray soap bubbles. Uh, you've got to have pressure in the system to find a leak like that because uh, well, like I say just that's like in the whenever you're checking using the uh, method of checking for uh, compression leaks into the water you see you can't do a compression test I'm sorry with a uh, not a compression test you can't do a test pumping up your cooling system and find that that you're gonna have to have the high pressure that's on the proper side of the equation to show you the leak all right, so if there is pressure, use the recycler to recover the gas. On cold days, you might have enough to run the engine long enough to get the engine compartment good and hot. You may not get the gas out all the first time. What I mean by that is warm the engine compartment up until everything in there is too hot to touch, right? And uh, you don't have to be running the air conditioner, but it's running until it's just blistering hot. Uh, and you can actually have your, uh, your 96 inch hoses hooked to your recovering unit. And whenever it's super, super, super hot under there, I'm talking about like if it's 40 or 50 degrees outside or even colder, and you want to pull all the juice out of that, you better get run that thing long enough to make everything too hot to touch. You'll get just about all the refrigerant out on the first pull that way. But if it's a fall day and you just pull one in right off the yard out there that's been sitting there, and it's, you know, maybe 50, 60 degrees temperature under the hood, the ambience, 
and you kick on your thing. Now the, the newer J2788 units and the ones past that are supposed to pull all of the refrigerant out a lot better than these older ones did. Uh, and But I would actually run this one two or three times to make sure I got it all out. I, I would have periodically uh, used my yellow Jeep that I used to drive to pull it. I'd pull the refrigerant out put it back in uh, <clears throat> just because, you know, when I was thinking it wasn't quite cool and good. You could pull it out, measure what came out, put the right amount back in, right? Well, I pulled it, and I went in my office, and I was there by myself, and I went back out there, and I noticed it had outgassed a bunch of refrigerant. Outgassing means that it has bubbled out of the uh, oil that it's mixed with, kind of like a Dr. Pepper or something. And so I turned it on again, and I got some more out, and I got some more out, and I added all those numbers up, and that was a 1.25 pound system, and I pulled two pounds of refrigerant out of it because I had never actually completely evacuated the refrigerant out of it or pulled all the refrigerant out because some of it's going to stay trapped in the oil in that accumulator. And so it's really, if you're wanting to get it all out of there and make sure you get it all out of there the first time so you're not putting too much back in there, it's a good idea to do it two or three times and let it out, gas, do it again, let it out, gas, do it again. That's what I always like to do. So note how much came out compared to the specs and pay attention to how much oil was extracted because oil will come out too with one of these units and you got to put the same amount of oil back in because if you don't do that, I have known of people that went by the dealership and they had it, they kept pulling it out and just recharging it and they pulled enough oil out of there that they actually got enough oil out and it burned up the compressor. Yeah, and they, we had to put a compressor on one and that happened to because she said, I, I went to the Ford place, they couldn't find my leak and uh, they, they kept uh, pulling it down and recharging it and they must have done that seven or eight times and finally the compressor burned up. That's because the oil kept coming out along the refrigerant when it pulled out. If it still won't run with full charge, we got to find and remove the AC relay. Pull the AC relay out, the one for the clutch. Find the relay terminal that feeds the AC clutch. It's typically going to be on those little relays like that. You know, the one in the middle is the one that's hot. Uh, you know, the, the big terminal. There'll be two big terminals. And the big terminal that's right in the middle of all the other will be the hot one. And the one going out to the clutch will be the other big one. So if you find the hot one that's hot all the time, the other big one, if you got a relay with different size terminals, is going to be the one going out of the clutch. So make sure you know which one that is and how to find it. If the test light lights between B plus and the clutch terminal, just go ahead and apply some power, you know, bypass the relay by touching that. This light will go out and that clutch will cl click on. And that way you know you've got a good terminal, a good one all the way down there. There was a uh, 2010 uh, Nissan Altima I was talking about the other day on here on one of the other videos where this lady said that uh, you know she went to a her, her air conditioner just suddenly quit working like it, just, it was working and then it wasn't just like poof it didn't get and so she goes over there and they shine a flashlight around check some fuses and the kid that was looking at it said we well, don't know what's wrong but it'll be a thousand dollars you know <laughs> anyway she brought it over there and the first thing I did was I got a test light I did, and, and I, there, the, the wire going down to the AC clutch was really easy to spot because on that particular one and I hooked it to the hot side, and I went into that wire going to the compressor clutch with a test light, and it didn't light up. Okay, that meant the compressor clutch coil was open. And so we went ahead, and you, we, to verify that, we measured the resistance of the compressor clutch coil, and sure enough, it was open. And so uh, you can put a clutch coil on there, but usually it costs almost as much as a compressor, although there are variations to that, those prices and all. Uh, but we just went ahead and put our compressor on there, and... Uh, took care of that problem and you know since we didn't charge any labor at the college you wound up getting out for like $325 or something like that but anyway this is where you're going to troubleshoot your compressor you pull that out test slide between the hot side and the terminal going out here this ground should come travel through that coil and last that test slide all right so you can also check the AC clutch relay output with a test slide if you know how to do it I was basically going next to that you can't usually do that but on this Jeep I was able to do that I went under here and I was touching that terminal that goes out to the compressor. And you can tell on this particular one, I determined that the air grapple of the clutch was on because this was actually going out there. I got a good ground coming through the clutch coil. This one right here would light up whenever it was trying to turn the compressor on. But the compressor, uh, even though there's power going to it, after it heated up, it would quit cooling. And his symptom was he would drive it around, it cooled real good, but as it heat got warmer and warmer, it got to where the air conditioners wouldn't work at all. And we tap on that little clutch coil, I mean, uh, clutch hub, and it clicked in, and I said, yeah, that's going to be a, you know, set the air gap on that one. But there are these relay testing kits you can buy. You can go on Amazon, relay test kit, and it's got 
just about all the relays out there so that you can plug this in and plug your relay into it and all of these little terminals are sticking up so you can check the terminals and find out what's going on. That's a pretty handy thing to have. We had, I had that over at college too. Okay, so what if the test light stays dark? Well, the compressor clutch is most likely burned out, but don't forget to check the wiring and the ground connection. So I actually have seen wiring be clipped right here when there was nothing wrong with the clutch because you have wiring problems. And, you know, like if the wiring for, on some of them would get over close to a pulley or a belt or something and it would cut it and all that. So anyway, that's the most likely you're going to have to deal with that. All right. So if the clutch coil is good, with the relay removed and the AC on, you ought to have two powers and two grounds. Right. So if you've measured this, the light comes on, you know the clutch coil is good. With the relay removed, you've turned on the air conditioner, the air conditioner is supposed to be running, you ought to have two powers and two grounds. Now if you don't have a ground coming from your, from, from your controller, there may be a reason why that it's reading something it doesn't like or whatever. I have seen a Buick where another module uh, prevented the computer from actually turning on the compressor or the fan. That was an aggravating thing. Okay, so you ought to have two powers to do ground. You ought to have power here, power here, ground here, ground here. You know, any relay circuit is like that. If that relay is supposed to be energized, you ought to show two powers and two grounds at that relay socket. That's just really important to know that. Cool's fine, and then stops after driving, bump the clutch, you know, they measure the gap with that, and find out what it's supposed to be, I think usually 18 to 20 thousandths or 22 thousandths or whatever. If it's got over about 25 thousandths, that's usually too much, and there will be some wear between this hub and this pulley, as this pulley spins all the time and that slaps in, it's liable to wear, out, wear some metal out of there. Chevy's need the special tools sometimes. I love these shims. You know, Ford did that, and all the Chryslers did that. On the, you can just take a center bolt out of the hub on some of these Chryslers and Fords and just grab it and pull it out of there. Now be careful not to drop your shims. And they have, you can buy those little shim kits that are various different lengths. And you can add or subtract shims to get your air gap where it's right. That's really important. My John Deere uh, F525 lawnmower has got an AC style compressor clutch that I had to replace, and they says, don't try to do this yourself, let a professional do it, yeah, well, hogwash. Anyway, I got under there, and I had to use shims to set the air gap on that one so it would work. You see, so that's a fairly common thing right there. You can use the data stream, look for the HVAC inputs and outputs. If the compressor doesn't shut off, the evaporator will freeze. That's usually because of a stuck relay, a low pressure cutout switch, it won't open, or an evaporator temp sensor reading is just dead wrong. This particular one was freezing up. I actually have seen a, uh, a Dodge truck that was freezing up because the low pressure cutout switch was stuck. You can feel of those switches whenever we just put your fingers around those switches and whenever they click off and on you can feel them do that. With your, you can feel your click like that. So um, anyway if it clicks and it, but it remains closed and the thing freezes up. See that, that temperature coming out of the register went down to 20 degrees. The evaporator froze up. We lost our airflow. But the evaporator temperature thermistor was reading 48 degrees. And if it didn't get below 40 degrees, it wasn't going to cycle a compressor off. And that was a very confusing job, but that's another story for another time. But that's what I wound up seeing on that one right there. And this is on the same vehicle as that one. So it was reading 20 degrees, but this was reading high. I might jump through all kinds of hoops. That was on a Ford Fusion. Another time on that, you know. All right, don't forget the fuses and the switches. You know, you got fuses and switches all over the place. And make sure your pin fits good uh, on, on the pertinent pins in your air conditioner circuit. If you got spread pins, you obviously going to have the same trouble you will anywhere else. Now, this right here is the final slide. There will be a test that I'm going to put out tomorrow. Um, you watch this video here, watch it all the way through. You're going to see a test the next day, which is, this will be Tuesday. Uh, that's basically going to be just a video that runs through a bunch of slides like you're used to seeing from me where I ask you the questions and then on the answer side of it, you know, you'll they'll be highlighted in yellow and all that kind of thing. Does the compressor engage? You can freeze that. I've shown you this before, uh, but you can freeze that and uh, save it on your phone or whatever. Does the compressor engage? Yes. Well, the pressure is low on the suction side and high on the discharge side, you know, if they does engage. See what I'm saying? Uh, if they're not, check your compressor health in orifice or TXC. Uh, suction line cold and liquid line hot, check blend door. See, it's basically a fairly little simple thing. This is a generic setup. You know, there's 
going to be some other ones that this won't apply to, but this is basic rule of thumb. I, I, I created this for my students. You won't see it anywhere else unless somebody got it from me. Uh, if it won't engage, does it have at least 60 psi of static pressure? Does the clutch have, if it does, does the clutch have, the pressure have, clutch have power when you turn it on? ID refrigerant recharge and retest, does the compressor engage, so on and so forth. You can see how that circles around. Scan for AC request, check for fuses, relays, and pressure switches. Does clutch feed wire show ground with AC off? Test to follow. See tomorrow's scheduled video. And I really appreciate you guys coming around. We'll talk to you later.